Hey there, Dave Politis, Scan and Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here, friends. And uh, this segment will be about missing people and some of the letters I get from you guys. <coughs> so everybody should like it. And uh, thanks for being here. So I've had my YouTube channel for about four years, actively working it for maybe a little over a year. And we hit 100,000 subscribers back at the end of the first film, Missing 411, first documentary. So it's been at least a couple years of uh, surpassing that 100,000 subscriber list. So a while back, somebody said, hey, Dave, you know, where's that plaque from uh, YouTube showing that you got 100,000 subscribers? I go, I didn't even know you could get one. Nobody ever told me. They said, yeah. So I looked around YouTube and it's true. They give you a plaque. So I applied maybe six months ago and they said that they were investigating our channel for unknown reasons. So then their investigation went on for about six months and they said, oh, you qualified. The next week after that, I got a strike. So I wanted to show you guys what they actually gave me. So this is what it, it's kind of a, looks like an aluminum plate and it's hard to see, but it says uh, presented to Can-Am Missing Project for passing 100,000 subscribers, signed YouTube. So 100,000. The next step The next step is when you go over a million, and I doubt that will ever happen. But I wanted to read you a letter that YouTube sent with it. It says, chances, okay, do you remember your first subscriber, your hundredth or your thousandth? Chances are you do. As you know, you'll definitely remember the hundred thousandth subscriber. Your fans may have found you while searching YouTube, learned about you through a friend, maybe you showed up as a recommended video. No matter how they came to your channel, fans stayed and their numbers increased because of your unique voice and the excitement of being part of the commu community. We are thrilled to see the development of your community and are proud to honor your impressive milestone by reaching 100,000 subscribers with the Silver Creator Award. Congratulations. We know that you have many more stories to share with your community and we know that your fans can't wait for you to engage and amaze them with your commitment. So keep creating, keep building. We can't wait to see you and what you'll do next. We're here to support you along the way. And who knows, when you reach your millionth subscriber, we may just write to you and ask, do you remember your 100,000 subscriber? Sincerely, Susan Wolzicki, CEO of YouTube. So what's surprising to me about that is it's a nice plate. It's, it's, it's decent, okay? Now, I've already told everyone close to me what I'm going to do with this is when I get my third strike on YouTube, I'll probably film this episode. We're going to go out to the shooting range with Angie and a bunch of buddies, I think. And we're going to blow a whistle. And this is going to be our target. And we're just going to blow it to smear the rings. Yeah. Because that's my frustration with YouTube. Imagine that you had someone that had built something from nothing, like all these subscribers have. And, and then just treat them like second-rate people not answer their questions, not assist them with answers, not explain why a strike happened. I mean, it just befuddles me how, how low they treat some people that aren't bad people. So it's pretty frustrating. So that's my YouTube award. Now, there, there were a lot of questions about the Kelso conference. Uh, going to be up here in a couple days. Squatch Fest. I will not be there. I, I've said that. And 
I think that there's a group of people out there that are disappointed and some have almost made me try to feel guilty for not going. Folks, my responsibility just isn't to myself, but it's to Angie and it's to you. Now, let's suppose that there's some crazy and obscene people out there in the Bigfoot world that are really trying to do us harm. I don't need collateral damage by other people getting hurt. There's kids at these conferences. I don't want them getting hurt. But understand something. This is about restricting the message. They don't want my message getting out. They don't want me being heard. And if you've ever been to a Bigfoot conference, and if you never have, you should go. But if you've never been, there's a couple of different factions of that world. There's the people who want to kill one. There's the people who don't believe in killing one. And then there's the people who have been in this Bigfoot world for decades. And their mind has was made up the first minute they entered it. Some have very high educational credentials and they won't be budged by a thousand people. And some of the audience just immediately believes the people with high credentials because they must be right. But what they don't like is somebody who's rational, comes in with data, comes in with information that can't be argued. That really puts holes in their, in their presentation. And unfortunately, last year when I was at Kelso, I just stated the facts. And one, one specific person didn't like that and attacked me on Facebook. And subsequent to that, I've never heard from the person again, but he wasn't there this year. And I'm going to guess that somebody from the opposition side is going to take my spot as a speaker at this next conference later this week. I have no doubt. They're probably clamoring all over the organizers trying to get in. I have no doubt. So I feel sorry for the people that are going because you're going to you're going to get pushed into a corner by certain people. And if you remember, if you look back in history, all of the regimes out there, they tried to restrict speech. Did that ever work out well for them? Now YouTube and several other platforms are doing exactly that. And if you're in part of that political realm that thinks that's a good idea, think about this. Everything comes around eventually. I would never before anyone's speech being restricted because I think when the opposition talks, <laughs> it makes me look better. But I think that what's happened is that a certain segment of this Bigfoot world doesn't want me talking. So I feel sad that I'm not going to be there. But I guarantee you one thing. I will cancel one conference because I wasn't prepared for this. I will not cancel again. And I will come prepared with an army if I have to, to protect myself and protect you. And uh, I think they know that already. And Washington is kind of a strange state. And the conference is about 20 miles from Portland, which is a way, way, way left side city. And it was a risk going there last time. It was a bigger risk this time. So. Anyhow, I, again, I'm sorry I'm not going to be at the conference, but they were, there will be more. And uh, as somebody said, David, it, it's so weird because when you spoke at the last conference in Kelso six months ago, you didn't talk hardly at all about Bigfoot. You talked about missing people. Again, they don't want that talk. So, on some letters, which there are some good ones this week, and uh, 
I appreciate you writing in. Uh, I guess I should tell you that the search for a a platform to go to, it will not be Rumble. And I've said this and I explained it before, but uh, it will not be Rumble. Clearly, it will not be. Do some research about who they just hired. They just hired a female that has spent her entire career almost working in the Chinese region on film and that platform many concerns okay first letter Dave my name is George I'm a professor of economics at a research university in a neighboring state to Montana regarding the purpose of higher education the goal of research is to generate new knowledge and the role of the educator is also sacred passing down the existing body of knowledge to the next generation is the most important duty I can perform I started in academia to make the world a better place. My present journey began 9-11-2001. As, as I watched the events of the day unfold, the narrative did make sense. Particularly troublesome was the collapse of Building 7, when it had not been hit by an airplane, and one of the building's main tenants was the CIA. Building 7 was the CIA headquarters for New York City. So for the past 20 years, I've been known as the black sheep of the university faculty, a title I hold with honor and distinction. Every semester, I point out discrepancies with official narratives of our history. I point out inconsistencies with both the JFK assassination and 9-11. Remember the term conspiracy theory? Yeah, it was created by the CIA to stop people from questioning the official JFK narrative. I've said that all along. Around 80 to 90% of my students appreciate an alternative explanation, even if they don't agree with me. Challenging one's belief system and then researching for oneself what is accurate is part of the personal growth that is supposed to occur in a higher education. Stop there for a second. When I give you information on my Friday videos about news, I have not had anybody post something to say, Dave, you are a thousand percent wrong, and here's the link to prove it. No, but I get a lot of comments. I don't like your political talk. Hmm. You mean you don't like the facts I'm giving you, but that's not what they say. Now, part of my talk on Friday is to open your mind up and to get you to do more research. I want you to question me, and I want you to go out and see for yourself. Don't believe mainstream media. Don't believe the the left wing or the far right wing. I want you to look and search for yourself. Get the facts. Almost every semester I have one to three students who cannot handle my questioning the official narrative of history. Immediately, rather than talking to either myself or my department head, they immediately contact the dean's office, the provost or the president's office in order to report me. These students literally cannot handle myself, a person of influence questioning the official narrative. Their psychological well-being cannot handle someone questioning one's reality. Bingo. That's what happens with some viewers right here. If they believe A is just a 100% great person making great decisions, that had a great background, that never lied, never plagiarized anything, and then all of a sudden you hear someone saying, the exact opposite, inciting facts. You do one or two things. You either have a complete meltdown and realize that the person you've been supporting is a loser, or you shut down this person, you demean the person giving the message, and you walk away and forget about it. Unfortunately, that's a lot of people in our world. <clears throat> I first listened to you when Ben and Rob on the Edge of Wonder interviewed you. Your research appeared to be credible and well documented. I followed you for over the past five years enjoying each video you release. Sad to see Edge of Wonder removed from YouTube. Yeah, it was. I noticed the same passive aggressive behavior patterns being enacted against you that I have experienced for two decades. Oh boy, that's not good. <clears throat> I 
I am protected. Sad but true, professors who bring in large amounts of grant money are treated differently from other faculty members, but I am concerned about physical threats to you. Here's the point of regarding passive aggressive behavior that I would like to explain. All of us right now have a more fractured sense of safety than we did two years ago. For individuals with mental health issues, namely anxiety and depression, let's call them highly stressed individuals, this is especially true. Please remember that stress does not have a linear effect on human body. It has a cumulative effect. A person who has experienced years of stress has little or no resources left to deal with any new or additional stress. This person simply gets crushed and capitulates. We are taught in our K-12 through education system a relatively safe narrative of history. In World War II, we were told the good guys, comma, the Nazis and Japanese leadership were the bad guys. We, being the good guys, saved the world. Most people in every country on earth are good people. Most Americans inherently trust their government and the leaders of our large institutions, public and private. For each person's psychological well-being, people need the narrative that America is a safe place. The rest of the world might be corrupt and dangerous, but people in my town and my local leaders have my best interest in mind. Therefore, psychologically, I am in a safe place. The problem is, when someone is in a position of authority, questions the official narrative, and removes the certainty of the psychological safety one currently is enjoying. Stressed individuals cannot handle losing their security. They literally cannot handle it. Some individuals would do anything to kill, shoot down the canary in the coal mine so they can return once again to a well-constructed narrative of safety and well-being. <laughs> That's why I'm reading the letter. Well said. Now, somebody comes along and disrupts that? Well, for example, at the beginning of the, this is where I gotta be really careful. At the beginning of the pandemic, the message from our major media outlets is that you have a compromised immune system, you're going to die. But if you get the vaccine, you will be safe. So the person goes with the mindset that I'm going to die and to, I am now safe. <coughs> the person cannot handle being removed from a place of safety to once again put one's life in danger. This is personal. The person may emotionally explode or melt down. They will fight tooth and nail to discredit any attempts to challenge the official narrative that they are now safe. I do believe this is also the reason for the intense resistance you have been receiving lately. I hope this provides a useful perspective. When a per person believes she or he is going to die, they cannot listen to reason. Rather, they require their belief system to be reinforced. 99.99% .99 of your listeners sincerely appreciate your hard work and your message based on factual information and common sense. Thank you. So there's a viewpoint that many would not understand about themselves. They would put up the blinders, put up the defense mechanisms, call this professor an idiot, call me a fool, and go to name calling. And maybe make complaints. One thing I've said before, that on, as I've gotten older in life, my patience on some things is much greater. And my reactions are purposely much slower, verbally. When somebody says something to you that is about to gain an instantaneous angry response, you're way better off taking a deep breath, understanding the situation, determining what the outcome will be if you say something, and then determining how that will be perceived in the next day. Because you remember when you've gotten into arguments with people that are significant in your life, you think about what is said days later. And if you really gauge the response and you really think about what you're going to say, 
the outcome in the long run will be much better and in your favor. That's why email is so nice. I could sit there for a day or two and think about a response to someone rather than immediately having to go at it. But there's a certain side in our world that immediately goes name calling, calling you a racist, and that's the creed that they live by. I, I would really love to get them in a room and understand what moral code they live on. And when you think about the people that are threatening me at the conference, what's their moral code? Do they have morals? How could they justify their behavior in front of their own parents or their children? Years ago, I used to purposely think about my kids when I had a big life decision, especially if it was a public decision regarding my book or what I was going to say at a conference. Because I would think sometimes, okay, if they were looking over my shoulder, what would they have to say about that? Because that's important to me. And that has, over the term of my life, worked out well for me. And I would, I would hope that some people would use that same analogy in their response and in dealing with people that brought a conflict to them. So, Professor, thank you very much for that letter. Next letter. Dear Dave, very, very sorry you have to cancel your appearance in Washington. As distasteful as that letter you read is, I really disagree with the statement that you may have become complacent. I work in an occasionally rough town, do investigations, and much of the time I am working I-95, the eastern drug corridor connecting the top of the U.S. to Miami. I'm by myself, counting back up five minutes at a rare best, up to 10, 15, and 20 minutes. Here's the point. I've stayed alive since going full-time in 2004, and I guarantee I know you make one heck of a partner and person to learn from and acquire a higher level standards. That's why I watch you. Watching you increase my edge because you are obviously so damn well trained and have such high standards and intelligence. I hope the letter you read was sent with the best of intentions, but that apparent dig about having become complacent is obviously so far from accurate that I either doubt the sender is law enforcement or if they are, wouldn't want to have to work with him. Thank you for being one of the law enforcement big brothers. I lost my brother-in-law, a veteran of the Charlotte Mecklenburg, North Carolina PD, and my county investigator, a Marine, took me under his wing during tough cases. And in the past couple of years, and being exposed to you really helps that fill that void. They were both constitutional upholders and people protectors and fine law enforcement officers, actually the finest. I see them in you. Thank you for being part of that fine example for me. Time to go back out there as I watch you on breaks on Sunday. I wish you the best. Wow. Thank you. I'm humbled. You know, with age comes maturity. And with that maturity comes that, that hesitation in speech. And I can think of times in my past where, when I was young, maybe in sports or something, and we got a tussle during a game or something where I said something to an opponent, probably wouldn't have been the nicest thing. Or during a hockey game, in a brutal hockey game, I got pretty mad. But it's were decades ago. So, yeah. So anyhow, next letter. I have a few supernatural stories to tell, but here's one I'd like to share now. It's short. I was young. I was under the age of 10. My grandparents had a cottage up in northern Wisconsin on a small, insanely deep freshwater lake, Gilas, G-I-L-A-S Lake. <clears throat> Next property over was owned by a relative of theirs. We kids loved hanging out on the relative's property because it had a small sandbar that jutted out into the lake. 
Anyways, I remember one night watching the Aurora Borealis from the beach area. But some of you didn't know you could watch that in Wisconsin. It was the one and only time I actually saw that Borealis lights in the night sky. It was beautiful. And its colors were brilliant. It was so bright, in fact, that we noticed a huge tortoise swimming in the lake right in front of us. As we watched the tortoise enjoy his late night swim, out a few feet to the left of him shimmered something. Something similar to a see-through saran wrap entity others have spoke of. I couldn't make out a shape as it seemed to morph as it moved. It either came up out of the water or faced out in the water. It was hard to tell as it made no sound and didn't seem to disturb the water. As it passed over, almost as if it was floating on air, over the tortoise, the tortoise disappeared from our sight, almost as if it was being cloaked by the see-through shimmering thing. In a split second, it rocketed upward into the night sky and disappeared. The tortoise was gone with it. It was all quite bizarre. However, what was even more bizarre was that when I got to take leave and trek back home through the woods, I immediately tripped over a large, empty tortoise shell. How it got there, I can't say. It wasn't there before. It made no sound when it was placed there, or if you'd like to say dropped. It looked like the same size shell as the missing tortoise. What was odd, though, is that it had no freshwater seaweed smell or any scent at all, nor was it wet. It was perfectly clean and sterile. My uncle said that the unseen realm plays games like that. I don't think it was a game for that poor tortoise who had clearly lost his home and was most probably dead. Here's a thought about the unseen realm. If you truly want to know more about it from a Christian perspective by a reputable theologian, I suggest a book by PhD Michael Heiser called The Unseen Realm. This is the first book which discusses in depth all the biblical and other non-canonical references to this realm and what lives in it. This book was a huge index of where he got into his info. I know how much you love a good index, and I do. And as I've stated before, a book without an index is a weak effort by the author. The next books to follow would be Demons and his other book called Angels. I sent you an email before explaining my 40 plus year battle with bipolar and how I attempted suicide. When it failed, I saw my father's heartbreak over him believing he had lost me. I vowed to him I would live for him. I know that if Ben had realized how much anguish and pain he has eternally caused you, his decision would have been different. Do not think that there was anything you could have done to change his path. The only thing that could have possibly swayed his decision if he could have seen the future and knows death wounded you forever. I wish I could take the guilt away that you feel. For there is no guilt for you to bear. Ben's death has nothing to do with anything you did or didn't do. It had everything to do with his state of mind. I, like Ben, excelled at everything in life. And I excelled most at overthinking everything in the most unhealthy way possible. My beloved dad died of cancer recently. Maybe he was talking with Ben, for he was a very spiritual and thoughtful and humble man. I can envision them having wonderful conversations, basking in the light and the love of our Heavenly Father. Whew. You know, in counseling, I was told, hey Dave, you get in those really depressing moments. Just go out for a walk. Talk to Ben. I do. And one of the things that I tell him is I've had a lot of great people in my life pass on. I tell him, hey, look that person up. They're really good people. They would support you. Can you imagine when we get to heaven if they can't hear us? There's no connection. I hope they can. It would seem foolish. Sit and talk. 
Okay, next letter. My wife and I are avid listeners and subscribers to your channel. As a matter of fact, we watch your videos at night and we go to bed instead of watching the same old crap on TV. I have a story that you may be interested in and also have a witness. This account happened quite a few years ago, winter of 79, in eastern North Carolina, outside a little town called Scotland Neck. A little background on me. I'm a retired U.S. Navy Chief Petty Officer, retired in 2000, and have recently retired again as a military contractor over the years. I've worked with the following organizations. Woods Hole Oceanographic, Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C., Bluefin Robotics, General Dynamics, Hydroid, Penn State, long, very, very impressive list. Well traveled both while on duty and as a contractor, so I've been all over the world and seen a lot of things. But this is one of the weirder things I've seen. I was stationed on a destroyer based out of Norfolk, Virginia from 79 to 82. In my hometown, the aforementioned Scotland Neck was only about 100 miles away, so I'd go back every weekend when I wasn't at sea. I was dating a girl who is now a nurse, and one evening we were just riding around the countryside just outside of the town. Scotland Neck is a very rural area surrounded by fields, cotton, soybeans, tobacco, etc. We are about three miles outside of town driving back towards through some dirt roads and went between fields. It was probably 9 or 10 at night, winter. I don't remember the exact month, but it was cold, and the soybeans had been cut as we were laying down in the field on either side of the car. As we were driving back to town, I looked over to my left over the treetops, and I see a large, dull, orange ball slowly bouncing over the treetops. It was the color of the sun when it sets on the gulf. It gave off no light. It gave off no light, but had an internal glow as if I had to guess the size, I would say 15 to 20 feet in diameter. When we saw it, we got scared and I accelerated the car from being probed, ha ha. But when we looked back, it was still on the same course and trajectory it initially had. So we pulled over, got out and watched it. It slowly bounced into the field that was on our left side. And each time it hit the ground and bounced up, it was higher than the trees, maybe 40 or 50 feet. It bounced over the road, bounced over the treetops into the field on the right side and disappeared. There is an old ghost story associated with this ball of fire, as the older folks in the area called it. We were not the first to see this thing. My grandmother said she saw it when she was a little girl, but it was a different area outside of town, as the crow flies maybe 8 to 10 miles from our sighting. If you're ever in Panama City, Florida, welcome to stay at our house. We have plenty of room as our kids are all grown and moved out. It's beautiful here. We'd enjoy having you. Thank you. And thank you for the story. I'd always, you know, again, I've, I've talked to you about unidentified submerged objects before. And there's a lot of Navy people that have seen things come out of the water that they can't be explained. There's a lot of submariners, submariners that have seen things underwater on their equipment that they can't explain. Gone by submarines at fantastic speeds. Love to talk to these people. Love to interview them. Give you complete confidentiality. It'd have to be in person, but I'd do it. The reason I read that story is I have a really good friend one of the best friends, who was at their house. Now, at a distance, <clears throat> they saw something almost identical to what this man explained over the tops of the trees, slowly moving. And uh, they only saw it once. Total sighting time was maybe a couple minutes. And they said that they felt that as they were watching it, it was moving with intelligence like they knew they were being watched. So, so January 2022 edition of the MUFON newsletter just came out. And they had a very good article about Lake Paranoa, P-A-R-A-N-O-A, -A in Brasilia, Brazil, August 21st, 96. 
what had happened was is that there are people uh, going to work about 4.30 in the morning and they noticed that uh, a bright light was above the road no defined edge to it and they saw a bright white light coming from the bottom of this craft towards the ground they watched it for a long time and then at one point a professional photographer was called and they took some pictures and really I saw some of the pictures they're not that good but again if it doesn't have defined edges and it looks just like a white light bulb not really a lot to see the point is is that it was over one of the biggest reservoirs in the area this paranoia and and again it caught my interest because it was water related hovered about 30 meters over the dam the military was called of Brazil and they dispatched a plane and the witnesses said as the plane came at the object the object just zipped off at incredible speed and when the plane turned to go away it came back which I've heard hundreds of times so again MUFON does have some really interesting articles now that Brasilia incident I'm going to talk to you about it here so this is Brasilia and this is the body of water that we're talking about it almost almost covers half the town in almost a half circle a lot of a lot of bodies of water that are large like this could harbor a lot of things we don't even know and why would I why do I say that because there's nobody looking underwater anymore think about it Brazil has always had a history of unusual incidents to say the least but uh, and I don't put a lot of I don't put a lot of credence in a lot of the sightings because they're so different from what we have in the United States. Now, this incident is almost right on key, so I get it. So, let's get into the missing person cases, all right? So, the first case uh, is in Arizona. It involves a man named Frank Patane. 60 years old, missing August 11th, 2011, in the early, early morning hours. He was a retired executive from Raytheon Corporation. Now, a month before this disappearance happened, he went in and had surgery for a detached retina. I had a friend just within the last year, Dean, if you're watching, he got a detached retina gave him a lot of heck. So anyhow, Frank Patain, he spent the night before the disappearance at a place called the Amberian, A-M-B-E-R-I-A-N, it's changed names, but Amberian Lodge. <coughs> and he told the people that he'd be back that night after he took a hike. He left early in the morning and he didn't return to the lodge. So as they called search and rescue, and they went out and they found his Jeep on the Mount Baldy trail ahead, and he had signed in. Witnesses described him as having a red baseball cap, turned around backwards most of the time, and he was carrying two walking sticks. I'll give you a look at Frank Patain. He was an outdoorsman in excellent health, now, weirdly, on August 11th, the day he disappeared, there was a massive monsoon storm that hit the area. Very weird. Really weird. But he was going to attempt to summit Mount Baldy. Now, it's a sacred mountaintop to the Apache tribe in that area. And when he didn't return, 12 agencies got together and poured a huge effort into Frank, into finding Frank. There were dog teams, mounted patrols, helicopters, six day search and rescue, and searchers were covering a big area. 
Nobody thought he'd go off trail because the trail was pretty defined going towards the summit. Well, they didn't find anything. Let me give you the look here. So, he parked his car on the West Baldy trailhead and he went into this area. Okay? Now, there's a lot of water in that area, by the way. Well, when searchers got to their last day, they were dumbfounded because they couldn't find anything. So, this was on tribal property. So, on June 2nd, the following year, some members of the tribe were out antler searching. A lot of people collect antlers. And they came across some bones and some human remains. One of the pieces that they found were some Jeep keys. And they were later identified as belonging to Franks. They never determined the cause of death. But his bones were found 6.5 miles from the trail that he was supposed to be on. And they were in a gully. Nobody, nobody can understand why he was there or how he got there. Yet, nobody wanted to address it either. And I'm here to tell you that that is very odd. Now, there were multiple, multiple canine teams that were used. Didn't find him. He had a disability. He had eye surgery. And the weather was some of the worst that you're going to see in Arizona for a one-day period. Horrible. That was the Mount Baldy trailhead. Now, the importance of this case is, number one, canines didn't pick up a scent. Number two, he had a disability. Number three was the weather. And number four was the distance off the trail. It didn't make any sense. So, Frank Patain, a good man. That's what he looked like. Rest in peace, Frank. So, next case involves an individual, an older man, Joe Doman, Joseph Doman, 68 years old, <laughs> missing November 8, 2010, also in Arizona. He drove a white 2005 Forerunner. He had uh, an older daughter and an older son living in Chicago. But he lived alone, and he loved hiking so much that he joined a hiking group, and he went everywhere with them. Most of the time he carried two cameras, a GPS trail guide, and trek poles, and a backpack with a water bladder in it. He tried summiting Sheep Mountain three times uh, in the summer of 2010, and he didn't make it. He told friends that he was looking at getting a personal locator beacon, but he hadn't yet. Now, this case didn't happen that far from Frank's case. But on November 8th, Joe didn't tell anybody. Didn't tell, he was looking for other members of his hiking group, but nobody answered. And so he just left without telling anyone, leaving in a, didn't leave an itinerary, nothing. And he took off. Well, about a week later, other friends from the hiking club looked for him, went to his house, he wasn't there. And they knew he had to be hiking somewhere. So they did a search and they found his vehicle at a trailhead. And unfortunately, he wasn't in the car. <laughs> he lived in Mesa, Arizona. And he really liked to frequent the Mazatzal, M-A-Z-A-T-Z-A-L wilderness. And there was a trailhead there to Mount Pelee and that Mount Peely trailhead led to Sheep Mountain. Well, about eight days after he disappeared, searchers finally get on his trail and find the car. 
and his hiking club was all in on the search. They knew he was a tough guy, a real good hiker, and they wanted to understand what happened. So there's Joe Doman. So it's a six hour hike from the search and rescue park, parking lot where his car was found to the location where he was headed. So the searchers were flown in by helicopter. His hiking club assisted and the Toronto Rim Search and Rescue, the Gila County Search and Rescue, Maricopa County Search and Rescue all assisted. The Mazatzal Wilderness Area, 252,000 acres, lots of pine and scrub. The Sheep Mountain Summit was an 8.6 mile round trip, it takes 8 to 11 hours, elevation of 3,156 feet. Near the end of all this, the search and rescue was transferred to Maricopa County. And what the people said, first of all, this is Phoenix down in here. This is Mesa where he lived. And then this is the area where they found his vehicle in the wilderness area we're talking about. So you kind of get an idea where this all happened. Now at one point, his son came out helped with the search. They were able to get inside of uh, Joe's computer and they actually tracked some of his past efforts to get to the summit. On this incident, he had told others that what he really wanted to do was find an off trail way to the summit. Now I understand something. When you go off trail, like hunters do, and something happens to you, like let's say Joe broke his leg, Friends, you're not walking out. You're not moving. Breaking a leg is hugely painful. So painful, unless you have a pain threshold that's Superman's, you're probably just going to lay there and die if nobody finds you. Finds you. So that's why I tell people, carry a personal locator beacon. Now, in Joe's incident, hundreds and hundreds of people over the years have tried to find them. And they haven't found anything. No poles, no backpack. That, that stuff's going to last forever. So what happened to Joe Doman? It's the same thing that happens to a lot of people of older age. You just don't find them. But you got to remember something. Joe may have been in really good shape, but at approaching 70 years old, uh, could a 30-year-old in really good shape out hike him? Maybe. So why didn't they find him? How many places can you really hide? Very unusual case. Joseph Doman. Okay, now we're gonna go over to the state of Washington. We're gonna talk about a case named Robert Christensen. Now Robert was 19 years old on October 12, 1932. Pay close attention because I'm going to give you two places that are interrelated. October 12, 1932, he lived in a place called North Bend, Washington. North Bend, Washington. And right to the east of that is a mountain called Mount C, SI. Well, he and two friends were going to go deer hunting. And they went up the side of the mountain and they decided to separate and hunt. Now, Robert was a Washington State College student. He knew the area like you knew your backyard. He grew up there in that area. Well, his friends searched for him for a day, couldn't find him, searched for him for another half a day, and then decided to come out and get assistance, which they did. Now, during the search, it rained. They brought in multiple bloodhound teams from Seattle, and they found nothing. Now, that was October 12, 1932. As I have stated hundreds of times at conferences and on videos, that if I separate disappearances by 30 years, even 20 years, but 25 years would probably be the median, if I separate disappearances there, people are going to forget what happened there in the past. People retire. Commanders of search and rescue move on. Captains 
in sheriff's offices retire. And unless you do a real deep dive, you're not going to know really the history of a specific area. But this area of North Bend had another really strange incident happen, this time in the year 2000. Show you the lady, Shirley Bauman. July 22nd, the year's 2020. Shirley's son dropped her off at a trailhead. And that was at the Quartz Creek Trailhead, just outside of North Bend, east of it. And was they were gonna get she was gonna get picked up on 722. She was dropped off at 720, July 20th. Well, when the sun went there on July 22nd, mom wasn't there. So they call search and rescue. And they go all out. What would you do if you were search and rescue? Go up the trail. So they go up the trail about two, two and a half miles, and what do they find? Right next to a creek, right before the switchbacks that go up the mountain to Lake Bethel, they find her campsite in a good place, next to a creek, fresh water, good. They don't find her. So what they do is they look around, nothing's disturbed, nothing unusual, she's just not there. So the, they bring in multiple canine teams. And all of the canines hit on a scent, of her scent right around that campsite, and right around the trail immediately there. But outside of there, nothing. So they bring in drones, helicopters with FLIR, canines, multiple canines. So remember, the search was started on July 23rd. On July 27th, just four days later, they canceled the search. Which, in my humble opinion, that's a pretty quick cancellation. I would describe this as a beautiful area to go into. And go look at Mount C on Google Earth, SI. And then look at the trail, Quartz Creek Trailhead. Park your car, you walk over a bridge, and you get to the trail that she took. It's gorgeous, thick. Now, why is this so important? Why am I telling you about both these cases, okay? So, this is North Bend, Washington. This is Mount C. Now, this is the area that Robert Christensen disappeared in hunting with his buddies. Now, it's about a half mile from Bend to Mount C, where the crow flies. That's about the mileage. It's not very far at all to where the Taylor River is, where the trailhead for Quartz Creek is. You cross over the Taylor River, you get up to the base of the mountain, which is where Shirley's gear was found, and then you do a switchbacks going up to Lake Blethyn. So the distance in these probably can't be more than three miles, four miles. There's water and lakes everywhere in here. Get a little quote, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but all of the blue in here, if you look at it on your own map, you're gonna see it. Very, very obvious. So Shirley Bauman, she's never been found. Missing July 22nd, 2020. And again, if you ever want to go into that area, I would suggest, I, I, that, this is a place I would go because it is so gorgeous. And uh, again, the Quartz Creek Trailhead, just outside of North Bend, be just east of there. I'm gonna guess if I continue to do a deep dive on this area, I'm gonna find more people who have never been found. Just because, remember what I've told you in the past, if you find a wilderness area like this, that has lots of water, that's going to be the place where people start disappearing. Now, Shirley Bauman was the best friend of her son, and he was destroyed by her loss and her missing. 
So give it some uh, some visibility here. So I've given you four cases this time. <clears throat> two in Washington, two in Arizona, and three out of the four were never found. Now friends, after you watch these videos for a while, you start to get callous. You start to think, eh, they weren't found. Friends, it's very hard not to be found over time. Joe Doman, he's been missing for 12 years. Should have been found. Frank Patain was found. Shirley Bauman, Robert Christensen, both of those people should have been found. Where are they? Now, when you hear, like a lot of the cases I give you, where the people are not found, and you hear about 50, 60, 70 of them, and you think, oh, yeah, you know, it's hard to find people in the woods. <laughs> no, it's, it's not that hard. And the vast, vast majority of cases, people are found. What I'm giving you is the strangest of the strange. And canines are normally highly effective. I've told you before, the canines on the police team, every time I went out on a canine search, we found the person. I'm talking bad guys, good guys, etc. So to think that people aren't being found that much, something very unusual is happening. And then lastly, cadaver dogs. These are canines that are trained to hit on human decay scent. And that scent can go for miles and miles. So a canine doesn't even have to be near the body to hit on the scent. And I've told you before this that there's also these canines that can pick up a scent from decaying flesh underneath the water microscopic bubbles come up and they can smell that. So you can put one of these canines on a boat and drive a lake where someone's been missing for months and you can still find the body. They're phenomenal animals. Their sense of smell is so much better than ours. <coughs> and because of that, they are very valuable. One of the things that searchers do that I've never talked about is when you start looking for somebody who's been missing for oh, four or five, six, seven, eight days, you also start looking for birds. If there's a mass of birds flying in a specific area, coming in and out of an area, get your eye on the birds, and sometimes they will find a body for you. Sometimes it's that easy. And trained search and rescue people know this. So, I've given you a pretty comprehensive session. I think we've really touched on some great letters. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, I do wish that as a homework assignment, I could tell you, hey, everybody go out and tell people about, tell, tell three of your friends about this channel. I'm not sure if this controlled growth is YouTube's, Google's, or what? But tomorrow morning, I have a call with an executive at another platform. And they're kind enough to sit with me and we're going to have a Zoom call and answer a whole series of questions that I pose to them before I leave and go to them. So that's a real positive sign. It's a subscriber-based platform. But what they can do, supposedly, compared to YouTube, will be great. So, thanks for having the patience of being here. Uh, all of you are important. Each of you are important. If you're really depressed right now, I mean really depressed, call Suicide Hotline. Please, if you have depression, call NAMI. N-A-M-I. Get to one of their groups. Attend one of their sessions. They're phenomenal people. They can help. 
If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed. And lastly, do not ever, ever buy my books from Amazon, eBay, etc. Those are people ripping you off, charging super high prices. <coughs> Just buy from our website. It's listed right below under the description of the video. And it'll be in the pinned first comment. You are greatly appreciated. I'm humbled that I'm here with you again. And really, I haven't coughed hardly at all, all day. So, I'm way better. Been running. Health is way better. So thanks for all your thoughts. Have a great day. Politis out.